There was Mr. Lansky, uh, do you know why you've been subpoenaed to the grand jury? 
Can you make any kind of statement at all? No, I'm sorry, sir. You better ask the district attorney then. Mr. Lansky, how's your health? How you feeling? How do I look to you? Look pretty good. How do you feel? Well, at present, good. What tomorrow bring, I don't know. Mr. Lansky, what do you think about today's event, sir? Bye-bye. How did the hearings go, sir? <laughs> What do, you th what do you think about all the attention this deposition is getting, Mr. Lansky? Well, I can't comment on that. Ask the judge. <laughs> what the? What do you got there, honey? Mr. Lansky, do you have connections with this resort in California? Or did you? Come on. we got to move. Mr. Lansky, what do you think about Penthouse Magazine? I hate to tell you. <laughs> Watch yourself. Easy does it. Take care. pleased with the way your attorneys handled your defense? I'm sorry, but no comment. Well, you can't blame me for asking, can you? No, I don't blame you at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm with you. <laughs> Mr. Mellon, what did you think of it? I thought it was a proper verdict. Mm -hmm. Did you have any doubts at all? It seemed at uh, some points uh, that uh, the uh, defense might have a, a better case. Yes, I, uh, I, had, uh, I had doubts as to whether the jury would, uh, would understand the evidence, uh, could sift through the evidence and, uh, and get uh, the, the true facts. Mm -hmm. But then uh, I think after the argument this morning, I was... Well, as I understand uh, Judge King's ruling, he reserved Jerry? ruling on the motion for judgment of acquittal mm -hmm. and let the case go to the jury. And Mr. Rose and I has two weeks in which to file a memorandum to support that motion. So the judge could declare Lansky not guilty even though the jury has said he is? Yes, that's my understanding. What's the likelihood on something like that happening? You'd have to ask Judge King about that. I don't know. Now, Lansky must stand trial next month in Miami on alleged income tax evasion charges. And in June, it's to Las Vegas where he must face profit skimming charges from the Flamingo Hotel Casino. Ike Siemens, Channel 4 News. He was a remarkable man whose life spanned a remarkable segment of American history and society. One of the most unusual things about him was that he lived long enough to die in a hospital bed of cancer and the complications of his 80 years. So many of his contemporaries, sometimes at his order or with his consent, died so much younger in terribly violent ways. Lansky's death, in many respects, marks the end of an era. The Godfather movies are great American classics, 
not only for marvelous writing, acting, and directing, but for explaining how organized crime was conceived and nurtured in 20th century America. Across the entire breadth of organized crime's history, from the early Prohibition days in New York City to Havana before Castro to the glitter of Las Vegas, Meyer Lansky was there in the shadows as mediator, accountant, advisor to the mob. Al Pacino, as the godfather, comes to Miami to meet with the family's casino consultant. The house, the neighborhood, the television turned up to shield their conversation from FBI bugs, all are taken exactly from the real life of Meyer Lansky. He was born Meyer Suchaljansky in Grodno, Russia. He came to Ellis Island with his parents in 1911 as part of that massive immigrant wave of Eastern Europeans. As a boy, he came to know the Italians, who would later become the bosses of the American Mafia. Yet Lansky was more powerful, more influential than any of them in shaping the destiny and enormous success of the National Crime Syndicate, America's largest single business. His position is even more astounding when you realize that as a Russian-born Jew, he could never be a member of that inner circle of organized crime, the Italian Mafia. He was a brilliant man who may have understood human nature better than Freud, a practical man of enormous self-control who, with patience and planning and cunning, manipulated people and fortunes and entire governments. He may have been worth a billion dollars by the time he died, but he was so good at shifting and hiding money, his investments may never be found. He drove a leased Chevrolet. Because he used sex and greed to get what he wanted from others, he never let himself develop those kinds of appetites or vulnerability. For him, money meant power and winning. He left school after the eighth grade. Always small for his age, he learned to survive on the streets of New York with his wits. First a floating crap game, then a car repair shop that specialized in changing serial numbers on stolen cars and souping up Model Ts so they could outrun the police. With Prohibition, he formed the Bugs and Meyer mob. Their specialty was guarding shipments of bootleg whiskey smuggled in from Canada and the Bahamas. That was Lansky's first mediation job, trying to persuade the gangs they could make more money if they cooperated and ran their bootlegging like a business instead of constant street warfare. The bribe, he kept saying, is much more effective than the bullet. His partner in the Bugs and Meyer mob was Bugsy Siegel, a handsome ladies' man. In the spring of 1934, shortly after Prohibition ended, there was a national crime syndicate meeting. With liquor legal, they had to decide what their next ventures would be. Bugsy Siegel was sent to Nevada, where gambling had just been legalized. Lansky's assignment was the southeast, particularly South Florida and the Caribbean. Lansky had gone to Cuba in the early 1930s to begin a friendship with Cuban President Fulgencio Batista. The mob needed a supply of Cuban molasses for their distilleries. Lansky made the arrangements with Batista. By 1937, Lansky was living in Cuba. He ran the casino at the Nacional Hotel and the Havana Racetrack. When World War II shut down Havana tourism, Lansky moved to Broward County, where he began buying property that could be developed as nightclubs, hotels, casinos. Lansky never saw military service, but in the middle of World War II, he was tapped for one of the war's deep undercover assignments. Lucky Luciano, the most powerful of the New York Mafia bosses, was in prison. The OSS, later to become the CIA, approached Lansky, asking him to negotiate with Luciano. They needed Luciano's underworld connections to provide espionage intelligence on the New York docks and to prepare for the invasion of Sicily. Lansky arranged the deal. In return for the mob's help, Luciano was paroled and deported shortly after the war ended. In the late 1940s, Lansky achieved his first real power in the mob. His nightclubs and casinos lit up the skies in South Broward County. Bugsy Siegel opened the first hotel casino in Las Vegas, the Flamingo. But Siegel began to consider the Flamingo his own possession. He became erratic. The mob met and sentenced him to die. The night before a meeting with Lansky in Beverly Hills, Siegel was shot in the face as he sat in the living room of his movie star girlfriend. Twenty minutes later, Lansky's people moved into the Flamingo to announce they were the new managers. South Florida became Las Vegas East. The biggest entertainers in the country starred at Lansky's old Colonial Inn across the street from Gulfstream Racetrack. Casinos were illegal, but law enforcement did nothing about it. Most law enforcement officers were friends of Lansky. 
Some had become rich investing in mob-backed businesses. Early in his life, Lansky had learned never to deal with anyone who would not accept a gift or a favor. In 1950, the Miami Herald ran a long series of stories showing organized crime's connection to the South Florida casinos and law enforcement's ties to Lansky. The Herald won a Pulitzer Prize, and Senator Estes Kefauver, until then virtually unknown, brought his investigations committee to Miami. The hearings were an immediate audience success. So successful, Kefauver went nationwide with his investigation and became famous enough to run for president. I'm not going to answer another question. You just says I'm not under arrest and I'm going to walk out. While Lansky was running his casinos in South Florida, Batista was thrown out of Cuba. So when the South Florida casinos shut down, Lansky went back to Cuba to arrange for Batista's return. In 1952, Batista and the army seized power, and Lansky could have almost anything he wanted, so long as Batista got a piece of the action. In late 1957, New York Mafia boss Albert Anastasia argued the mob had let Lansky become too powerful in the Havana casino operations. It was a simple business decision. Anastasia, one of the most feared men in organized crime, was shot out of his barber's chair in New York's Park Sheraton Hotel. Lansky's power was complete. When Castro shut down the casinos, Lansky moved to Hallandale to supervise the development of casinos all over the world. When the first casino in the Bahamas opened at Freeport's La Cayen Beach Hotel, all of those in management positions were old Lansky cronies. Much of Lansky's time in the early 1960s was spent supervising, from Miami, the skimming operations in Las Vegas casinos. Lansky became public enemy number one for a task force of FBI and IRS agents. They bugged casino counting rooms, secretly opened courier suitcases. In 1971, Lansky and two prominent Miami Beach hotel men were indicted for conspiring to skim $14 million from the Flamingo in Las Vegas. Lansky fled to Israel, but American law enforcement authorities applied so much pressure, Israel deported him. He flew almost around the world looking for asylum, reportedly offering $1 million to any ruler who would take him in. All refused, and Lansky returned here to be charged with contempt of court and income tax evasion. The skimming charge was dismissed after the Las Vegas bugs were ruled illegal. An appellate court overturned the contempt conviction. A jury found him not guilty of tax evasion. Lansky moved into semi-retirement in a Miami Beach condo. After open-heart surgery, he was less active, but the mob still came for advice and counsel. In 1977, his stepson, Richard Schwartz, killed a mobster's son in a fight in a Miami Beach bar. A few weeks after Schwartz was released on bond, he was executed in retaliation. Law enforcement officers speculated that Lansky was told in advance that his stepson would be killed. It was a matter of simple respect. He would understand and accept. To run a casino, you have to know how to get along with people. At that, Lansky was superb. He had three ulcers, but on the surface he was friendly, soft-spoken, easygoing. If you need a favor, come see me. Anything to help a friend. Scores of businesses in South Florida would not be here today if Lansky had not been there to help with a small business loan. Dozens of political careers depended on his money and connections. It was an offer they couldn't refuse, and they often returned the favor. He was a man of his word. A deal was a deal. Fifteen years ago, I asked him, when are you going to write your memoirs? He put on his best smile and said, there's nothing to write about. You guys make up all that stuff. But I know of no character in fiction who lived through as much intrigue in so many places with so many people as Meyer Lansky. On Miami Beach, I'm Clarence Jones, Channel 10 Eyewitness News.